Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Natalie Paquin, the president and CEO of Points of Light, and it is wonderful to be with you here today. Thank you for joining us. Listen, Learn, Act to End Racism is an initiative by Points of Light and Morehouse College for individuals, businesses, and nonprofits that care about creating a more just and equitable society and want to take informed action to support an end to racism. We knew after the death of George Floyd that we had to take action. And while we weren't experts on racism, we were experts in convening and wanted to bring people together for deep, insightful conversations. We are grateful to our content partners at Morehouse College and especially the leadership of Dr. Clarissa Myrick Harris, who has brought diverse ideas and speakers and led us in these tough conversations. In November 2020, we committed to having 20 conversations over a two year period, and we have done just that. Uh, today is our 20th conversation, and we are so grateful to all of the participants who have joined us over these last two years. We've had participants and leaders, community leaders, including uh, people like Dr. Bernice King, Michael Smith, Dr. Eddie Glaude, Bakari Sellers, uh, Melissa Bradley, and Dr. Tiffany Bussey have been with us in the past, and they are joining us again today, along with Eris Scales and Delilah Wilson-Scott. Nearly 9,000 uh, people have joined us for these conversations, learning about racial equity movements, organizations, leaders, and everyday people who have experienced and are actively working on solutions for social injustice. We have curated a resource library of over 120 resources that continue to be available on, on demand on the Points of Light website. We encourage you to please take advantage of these resources that were shared with us by these experts. For those who have provided feedback uh, following our conversation, 94% of them said that they plan to apply the information learned or actions recommended during these conversations. We are very, very grateful uh, to our partners, Comcast, for their leadership and support. They have been with us from the beginning. And a special thank you to Delilah Wilson Scott for her leadership. Um, they really, these programs are not, uh, are not possible without leaders like Comcast and Delilah. Today's conversation explores the investments companies and organizations are making to support the economic em empowerment of Black women. Our panel will speak about how the right opportunities and ecosystems can mitigate the effects of these systemic obstacles. We could not be more pleased to present this conversation um, with the dynamic women whose careers I follow. It is with great humility and gratitude that I welcome you to this conversation. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Clarissa Myrick Harris, who is ending her tenure as chair of the Humanities Dis Division at Morehouse College this, this month, but will continue to serve the institution as professor of Africana Studies, as well as co-founder and lead of the co college's cultural heritage preservation and digital humanities initiative which focuses on using public history and technology innovation to collaborate with faculty, students, and community partners to raise awareness and address social justice issues. We look forward to working, uh, to continuing to work with Dr. Myrick Harris in her new role. Welcome Dr. Myrick Harris, it's so nice to see you. Thank you, Natalie, it's so good to be here. And on behalf of the Morehouse College community, Welcome to our virtual audience and to our dynamic panelists who are committed to the economic and social empowerment of other Black women entrepreneurs. They are people who develop and support business opportunities for women that have a positive impact on their communities, society, and, and ultimately the world. You know, it's hard to believe that it has been two years 
since Morehouse first engaged in offline conversations with uh, you, Natalie, and your team about creating a virtual conversation series to raise awareness about systemic racism and ways that individuals and organizations and institutions can and are working together to stymie racism in all its forms, including racial discrimination and inequality, social and economic disparities, and racially motivated violence. Those initial offline conversations have led to a total of, as Natalie told us, 20 conversations in the form of webinars, including our discussion today. Morehouse College has been proud to partner with Points of Light to bring to the 9,000 people who have logged in to see and hear these discussions, our thought leaders, scholar activists, educators, researchers in myriad fields who are part of the Morehouse community, along with community organizers, nonprofit leaders, corporate representatives, and many others who are dedicated to using their time, talents, and resources to help stamp out social injustices. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tiffany Bussey, founding director of the Morehouse College Innovation and Entrepreneurship Center, MIEC, as it's known, is a global model for providing minority serving institutions contract support in the areas of process improvement and organizational management infrastructure development. Dr. Bussey, thank you for joining us again uh, for this conversation to moderate this session and providing the framework for today's conversation. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clarissa. And thank you, Natalie, and the Points of Light organization for inviting me again uh, for, to, to moderate one of these conversations. I am so delighted to be here. And thank you all for who, who has joined us today for this conversation. Thank you. As I reflected on how best to set context to this conversation, I could not stop thinking of the newest gift given to us last Tuesday from one of our most influential Black female entrepreneurs of our current time, Beyonce. Her newest single, You Won't Break My Soul, presents a clear theme of resistance, resilience, and self-determination which resonates with me and the story of economic empowerment and the power of Black women entrepreneurs. You see, as a Black woman of Afro-Caribbean descent, an immigrant to the United States, as a mother, as a wife, an entrepreneur, this topic of economic empowerment and the power of Black women entrepreneurs is my reality. I grew up, I imagine, like most of you on the call, seeing strong Black women as the pillars of our communities, as the primary givers of our families, as nurses and teachers, to running grocery stores, market stalls, cook shops, laundry services, hair salons, and to even running the numbers. As history has shown, entrepreneurs are these pillars of our communities. It was not one of opportunity, but one of necessity to become an entrepreneur. You won't break my soul. Through the lens of the United States experience, Black women have steadily led the way for centuries. Black women led the Underground Railroad, where the unsung heroes of the suffrage movement organized freedom riders, paved the way for constitutional protection against sex discrimination, and remained consistent voting blocks in the United States to stand up for the rights of marginalized people. Black women entrepreneurs have been the key contributor to socioeconomic growth and the vitality of the United States since its foundation. We can point to a few examples of these phenomenal women. Though born a slave in Virginia, Clara Brown established a successful laundry business in the late 1850s during the American Gold Rush. Maggie Lee Walker, an entrepreneur and social activist, founded the St. Luke Herald in 1902. And in 1903, 
Ms. Walker charted the St. Luke Savings Bank in Richmond, Virginia, for which Ms. Walker also serves as the first black pres first president and female president of a bank. In 1902, we had Annie Turbo Malone inventing a hair care product line that revolutionized African-American hair care, followed by Madam C.J. Walker, the first black woman millionaire in America, who made her fortune thanks to her homemade line of hair, co hair care products for black women and whose legacy is still alive. We will hear from representatives of her foundation later on the panel. The story of May Reeves is one that resonates with many. In 1942, Reeves developed her own hat business in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania with $500 from a bank loan. It developed out of an affinity for her hat making crafts. She opened up her shop in the same building where she and her family live, providing her with the ability to live out her dreams and support her family during the Jim Crow era. Her business became a symbol of not only intergenerational black fashion, but also civic engagement and empowerment. You won't break my soul. Black women have contributed significantly to the economic development of America as they've always been part of the labor force. Due to the limited opportunity to work in mainstream enterprises created by systemic and structural policies and practices, such as the 1896 Supreme Court ruling of Plessy versus Ferguson that upheld legalized racial segregation, black women resorted to creating jobs for themselves using skills that would permit them to service the needs of specific market sectors. In 1910, the United States Census listed specific businesses owned and operated by African-American women as agriculture, lodging places, private household services, eating and drinking establishments, dressmakers, beauty shops, health practitioners such as midwives, and education. Ownership of many of these businesses types continue to be common business ventures among African American women sector today, particularly health services, social services, retail and education. Scholar M.S. Stewart argued in 1940 that the period following the Civil War, segregated and forced laws were created to restrict the ability of the African American to operate entrepreneurial firms on equal footing with whites. Stewart argued that African Americans were forced to develop separate enterprise and sell products to re restricted markets, what was coined the theory of economic detours. The lasting impact of government policies such as the 1933 redlining of pushing African Americans and other people of color to urban housing projects and causing black neighborhoods to be severely undervalued are still evident today. Although civil rights legislations in the 1960s made it illegal to discriminate, enforcement of these anti-discriminatory laws has been inadequate. Racial inequities and their ensuing socioeconomic and health consequences have led to these systemic barriers that still exist today and present challenges for women, black indigenous and people of color to create businesses. You won't break my soul. But despite these challenges, in 2021, the Center for American Progress notes that black women operate 1.3 million businesses that have generated 44.9 billion in annual revenue and employ almost 272,000 people. In 2021, we saw the highest number of new businesses starts. 5.4 million of those, 17% were black women, which compares to about 10% of white women and 15% white men. Despite these early starts, however, only 3% of black women are running mature businesses. We still have some ground to cover. 61% of Black women are self-funded. Only 29% of Black women entrepreneurs live in households over 75,000 
compared to 52% of white men. Even though these revenue streams is the lowest compared to other ethnic groups, black women owned businesses tend to persist beyond the startup average of three to five years of new businesses. The last stat, black women founders receiving only 0.34% of venture capital funding. You won't break my soul. That is the start of our conversation today. I am so delighted to really welcome our panelists who is joining us today for this engaging conversation, sharing what is being done to create these ecosystems despite these systemic barriers that are still against Black women and entrepreneurship. Joining me is Delilah, I'd first like to welcome Delilah Wilson Scott, Executive Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer of Comcast Corporate and President Comcast NBC Universal Foundation. Aries T. Scales, CEO, Walker's Legacy Foundation and Managing Director, Walker's Legacy. Melissa Bradley, Managing Partner, 1863 Ventures. Welcome. As we start this conversation, I would first like to pose my first question to Delilah. Compass, Comcast RISE, which stands for Representation, Investment, Strength and Empowerment, is part of Project Up, Comcast's comprehensive initiative to advance digital equality and help business a fortune of un unlimited possibility. Delilah, please tell us more about what's behind the why for this initiative. You're welcome. I'd be more than happy to do that. Um, first, thank you, Dr. Bussey, for that opening. I think after these past few days, we all need a reminder that you you won't break our souls. Um, and so it was great to hear you open up with that as well as just reminding us that that is our legacy. Uh, so Comcast Rise, I mean, it was it, Comcast Rise was born from some of the very same issues that sparked uh, this very forum to be created and, you know, want to thank again Natalie and Clarissa for um, guiding with their steady hands the leadership of their organizations to bring this together. But when you think about the widespread, unprecedented widespread acknowledgement of the social injustices today, um, all which were exacerbated by COVID, when we launched Comcast Rise, we wanted to think about the small businesses that were impacted, that were most disproportionately negatively impacted at that moment in time, and that led to the launch of Comcast Rise. So to date, we've been able to help over 7,000 entrepreneurs, women, and people of color around the country with a combination of $10,000 in unrestricted grants. Um, and many of those lucky recipients have also been able to work with Melissa Bradley, who you'll hear from shortly, the coaching, her coaching that happens through Eureka, as well as having networking technology and marketing services as well. And I think when we think about that program, when we think about economic empowerment, because you cannot have social justice without economic justice. I think we all understand that, um, but we don't all lead with that. But I think it's important, especially for entrepreneurs, when you think about economic empowerment, you think about ownership, you think about sitting in the position where you are making the choices on who to hire, which vendors you will leverage, how you will support the communities. And there's much data to support that entrepreneurs, especially women entrepreneurs of color, are more likely to give. You mentioned in earlier just the many examples that we point to about how that impact is certainly multiplied in communities. So it's been an honor to see Comcast Rise grow over time um, and to see that commitment really shine for everybody across our, our company, uh, which has been great. We even have several of our small businesses being highlighted through a number of different ways, not just being part of Comcast Rise, but we have several of the goods and services being highlighted at Aspen Ideas Festival this week. We encourage encourage all of our employees to, to support these businesses. Everybody has a small business in their life. And so i um, just excited to, to be able to support 13,000 small businesses by the end of this year. Wow, that is significant. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Melissa, 
in your career, you have launched several for profit and nonprofit uh, businesses and several under the pre uh, President Clinton's and Obama's administration. What has your experience been as an entrepreneur and how has your personal experience influenced the work of 1863 Ventures? Yeah, thank you. And it's always great to be here and, and to be with friends is, is wonderful. And I appreciate people listening. <clears throat> There's a lot going on in the world, a lot going on in the world right now. So I appreciate you making time for this important conversation. It, the spark for all of this was was my uh, going to the Small Business Administration when I started my first company in uh, 1989, 1990, end of 1989, after I'd graduated uh, and being told that I would not get funding because I was Black, I was a female, and they didn't know any successful Black women in financial services. And when I left that room, uh, I could have done a lot of things. But when I got to the bottom of the elevator uh, on the first floor, I said, if there's something I can ever do so it doesn't happen to anybody else, I want to make sure that happens. And, and so that's really what my life has been dedicated to, because it was such an arbitrary reason of why they were not going to invest in me, not because it was a bad idea, not because my financials weren't legitimate, not because I hadn't done my homework, but because of who I was and, and how I showed up in the world. And I think to the sister that you shared earlier, there has to be a fundamental shift. When you know, I, I you talk about the new majority. You know, not only is the new majority people of color demographically, but we are the fastest growing segment and the largest swath of entrepreneurs after an almost forty year decline in entrepreneurship by white men. And so, the reality check that is needed to understand that when we think about the future of this country, where small business is the primary driver of employment, we have to recognize that the CEOs are going to look different. Um, you know, I think the important things that I have tried to work on uh, in order to be able to help entrepreneurs cut across all different sectors. Uh, when I served you know, under President Clinton, I was in the Department of Treasury and specifically focused on small business funding. Uh, I'm very pleased and proud of some of the legislation and more importantly, the advances we were able to make with big banks to understand the significance of having both supplier diversity, but also investment relationships with these small businesses. Uh, certainly coming into the private sector and, and to Delilah's point, uh, being a co-founder of Eureka, humbled uh, that we've been able to distribute over $150 million uh, since COVID and George Floyd designed to give cash to small businesses, but to really provide wraparound supports for, for coaching and access to community. Entrepreneurship is a team sport. And so we find that many entrepreneurs need access to communities to be able to share time, share wisdom, uh, share responsibilities, because many of them are solopreneurs. And we know statistically that a solopreneur in this country, irrespective of race, averages around $37,000 annually revenue. Once you're able to bring in another full-time employee, you actually are almost 400000 So the significance of really helping these businesses grow should not be overlooked and helping people move beyond a uh, sole proprietorship. And then I would say as an investor, I spend a lot of time trying to make sure they have access to capital, right? One of the challenges that I know entrepreneurs still face is finding the appropriate capital in, in the sequential uh, process that is needed, right? We, we know that particularly in the Black community, there's not a lot of friends and family. I asked my friends and family for money. They said, here's $2,000, but I need it back by next Thursday. That's not the friends and family that we're talking about. And so really being mindful of how do we fill those gaps of having high risk capital to be able to test that ideas, to provide that early stage seed funding so you can get your business up and running. And if you, whether you decide to do debt or equity, there is aligned capital that is non-predatory that you can actually access. And so it's been amazing to see all the grant programs, and particularly Project Rise, uh, around this important understanding that it is not just money, but it's also access to experts so that we don't make those mistakes. You know, I, one the last thing I'll say is that there's a lot of grant programs out there and I'm not mad at them. Um, um, but the reality is just giving somebody money doesn't really solve the problem because based on research that I've done, and I know you know I'm preaching to the choir, you know, Black entrepreneurs spend at least a quarter of a million dollars more than their white peers and at least, you know, four to seven times more on churning through consultants and trying to find the right lawyers and everything else. And so being able to really put together capital and community and coaching makes a big difference in being able to advance the entrepreneurial dream. Right. Thank you so much for that explanation and trying to get there. We'll definitely circle back to you, but I do want to bring uh, Ares into the conversation. And so Ares, the Walker uh, Legacy Foundation, which is a name in honor of Madam CJ Walker, provides entrepreneurial uh, finan financial and professional support to improve economic equality and entrepreneurial prosperity for women and girls of color. Tell us a bit more about Madam C.J. Walk and the work that, that you do today. Yeah, well, again, thank you so much for having me and uh, giving us the opportunity to talk about the work 
of Madam C.J. Walker, which is really the story of just women today, period, right, throughout the, the, the times. And so what is so fascinating about her, uh, you know, some sources say she was the first Black uh, self-made female millionaire. Some say she was the first female self-made millionaire. But regardless, right, this is a woman who was born in 1867. Uh, I think she had, you know, less than a year of formal education, married at 14, uh, and we talk about access to capital today and systemic barriers and racism, right? Let's think about the structures that she had to navigate and what she was able to accomplish. Uh, and so what I find so inspiring about her work and what we try to uh, model with the women that we support is that she didn't just create opportunity for herself, right? She created opportunity for other women to be empowered and to be independent and to be financially stable. And so as we think about, uh, you know, just the trajectory of entrepreneurship and as we think about economic uh, prosperity and, and growth, what is it if it's just us alone who's benefiting? And that real change and real power comes when we are able to make those kind of contributions. And so when I think about why women especially are so powerful, um, so needed in this space is because we are literally the backbone of our community. And so, you know, from raising children, from our civic participation, and then when you throw in the economic piece around being entrepreneurs, and Melissa spoke about this, right? The fastest growing demographic, we have to make sure that women, particularly women of color, particularly black women, are uh, especially supported in this endeavor. And so while we're opening doors um, and businesses faster, we also know that those doors unfortunately close faster, right? And we continue to have these challenges with so many different things. And so what makes me excited um, is that piece around, I love that Melissa said capital and community. And you know, our work is really centered around that community and those connections. I mean, since the beginning of Walker's Legacy, uh, and so we take women through business training accelerators. We cultivate and create opportunities for networking and for connection. And I think that's one of the things that we're seeing more and more um, where you don't have to be isolated as an entrepreneur, that this community is becoming vocal. Um, and while I would love for Walker's Legacy to be the only entity that does this, right, we're also seeing so many other amazing organizations who are popping up to create that space and those platforms for women. Um, so that gives me a lot of pride, a lot of joy. And we say, you know, we wanna cultivate the whole woman um, so that we're creating the next generation of legacy makers. Thank you so much, that, that is awesome. I wanna kind of really double click on that a bit, Delilah. And we heard, uh, you know, Eris just say that it really cultivates the whole woman. Can you share a story of impact that um, has been of deep meaning for you about a female entrepreneur who has come through your economic, uh, pen, since the pandemic towards success? What lessons do you think um, we can learn from, from those stories? Sure. And I, I think there are many, you know, it's kind of hard just to focus on on one. But like I mentioned before, everybody does have an incredible story of, of impact. You know, my mom was an entrepreneur. So just seeing her from being a seamstress in the home and then going out to have businesses, failure after failure until she reached success, it's, it's just a very different type of energy that it takes to, to run that business. But through the pandemic, um, one of my just uh, uh, sort of blessings is I love flowers. So I always have flowers behind me as well as in my, my office. One of my favorite florists is um, a florist called Amaranth Flores, really close to my home, owned by a Black woman who I didn't even realize she was a Comcast Rise recipient. So she, she, la she launched right at just before COVID. Um, she's been able to expand her business now. So she has a larger shop. She's now the, uh, the core florist for the Philadelphia Eagles, does a number of key weddings, um, and just, you know, proud to be one of her customers, but even more proud to know that, that she's been one of the many recipients of Comcast Rise. Um, but I think, you know, to the point that everybody has made, it's more than, it's more than just financial capital. 
when women tend to do things, we do tend to do them collectively. Um, and whether that's through our businesses, whether that's through our philanthropy, um, just being part of a cohort, just, you know, someone always rooting for you, especially because we all know it's tough to be an entrepreneur. It's tough to be an entrepreneur in any time, but in the midst of COVID, um, where we were already entering the situation undercapitalized without the same level of, of network support, social support, financial support um, to make it through and to, to flourish through that, um, you know, it's been powerful to hear the stories from around the country around that. Most definitely. And Aries, I would love to double back um, and just kind of ask you a few more questions around the work that you're doing. How have you seen some of the changes occurring in, in perhaps how you're delivering the service? Has it mm -hmm. changed since the pandemic? And has there been any critical uh, revolution in terms of how the program is being received? Absolutely. You know, a couple things there. So first and foremost, we all of our uh, trainings and our accelerators, initially we were doing in person around the country. And obviously when COVID hit, we went virtual, thinking it might be just kind of a temporary thing while we navigate the pandemic. And what we found was that being virtual was actually better for the women because so many of them were, you know, this might've been a side hustle or as an operator of an establishment to close their, you know, business, to take time to go through the accelerator and or to uh, find childcare was actually uh, cumbersome. Even though they made it work, you know, but when they no longer had to do that, it was like, wow. So our numbers went up uh, virtual, the response was overwhelming. And what we try to do with that is it's kind of make it hybrid. So now that we're evolving uh, with regards to, you know, like restrictions um, in terms of gathering is that we want our, our kickoffs uh, orientations to be in person, our graduation ceremony to be in person, but those classes, right, that we're creating uh, and delivering those virtually. And, and it has really forced us to get very creative about what community looks like in this online platform, right? And so uh, we're constantly trying to create ways for these women to continue to connect offline with their instructors, having them do breakouts together, that they're still being able to form that. But the other big piece was that, you know, we, we did our uh, COVID-19 impact study and we had a thousand women from across the country respond to this. And we wanted to understand obviously the impact of COVID on their business and I always say that I was expecting to hear some of the traditional responses around access to capital and technology and not having, uh, you know, maybe a, an emergency preparedness plan. But the number one thing that came back that surprised us was the mental wellness and health piece. And I was like, wow, right? Like, okay. So it forced us, when I say that we're about cultivating the whole woman, that's something that we just technically adopted, right, for us in, in the last year, because when these women came back telling us about all of the struggles and, and feeling comfortable and confident to share that, I think that that's something that we're also seeing now that's different, where before, you know, I always say, oh, the strong Black woman. I'm like, please do not call me a strong Black woman. I am a woman. <laughs> I am Black. And some days I'm strong and some days I'm not, right? Because when you start using that term, it's as if you can take so much more than anyone else. Or when you're saying that you have these moments of weakness or vulnerability, it gets dismissed. And so these women were really vocal around the challenges and issues that they were having. And so for us, we started to create additional curriculum, wraparound services, coaches and partners who could supplement uh, that self-care piece that mental wellness, I don't go mental health, but mental wellness piece into their practices and into our curriculum um, and how we deliver our programming. And, and the response has been overwhelming. I think more than anything, that what the women talk about the most is just having this opportunity to come together with like-minded women and to have a safe space where they can be honest about where they are and how they're feeling uh, along this journey. And so I, I love that piece. Yeah. Thank you. And I think the same can be said um, on our side as we uh, do the same sort of curriculum development, whether it is in the classroom for our students or externally for the businesses in the community, COVID did put that spotlight that the entrepreneurship training is not just about 
the numbers, right? The, the, the marketing, the business side, the business infrastructure, but it's about that individual, that entrepreneur, and really start thinking about how do we really teach this mindset? Um, for one, we introduce a new class at Morehouse, for example, on the whole idea of the historical context of entrepreneurship and how that has indeed affected our mindset. Um, when we look at the theory, it says that entrepreneurs are perseverance, uh, confident, um, however, and accept failure. Well, there are reasons why our community is, is low, low tolerance for risk, right? Perhaps if we double click on our history, we could find some, some answers or some theories there. So absolutely agreed with you that we're seeing this, this embracement of a wider breadth for the curriculum uh, in terms of how we teach entrepreneurship. So really, uh, really appreciate those comments there. Uh, Melissa, I wanna come back to you because one of the stats that we're seeing is that despite these early starts and all this volume in, in uh, female business and entrepreneurship, only 3% of black women are running mature businesses. And if we're truly gonna move the needle truly say that the, that the answer to this uh, path to closing the income inequality gap is through entrepreneurship, we have to scale these businesses. So what um, are some suggestions or some thoughts that perhaps you've seen um, that's working or, or can change this uh, trajectory that we're seeing here? Yeah, it, it's frustrating. Um, there's a new research that we're doing that's going to come out in a couple of months called Beyond Five, knowing that 50% of all businesses in the United States fail within five years. We found that Black entrepreneurs, particularly Black women's businesses, last at least 8.7 years. The unfortunate part is that their longevity, though, does not correlate to revenue growth or increased access to capital. So they are relatively stagnant. And so when we went to do subsequent focus groups, we realized that many of them still have part-time jobs, et cetera. Um, so I think there's three things. Um, you know, one, I, I, I obviously it's very easy to blame the system, uh, but the reality is, is that entrepreneurship is hard uh, and it's a team sport. And so we find that the inability to be able to access additional human capital who have experience causes stagnation. Um, I do want to say that entrepreneurship is not for everybody. It is hard to grow and scale a business. Knock on wood, I've sold one, I'm about to sell another one. Um, it is more than a notion to be able to get to a business of size, putting capital aside, right? The, the skill set is oftentimes not taught. It's one of the reasons why I started in 1863, because over 80% of the accelerators in this country focus on startups. They do not focus on growth. Very different set of skills, very different mentality. So I think one is having entrepreneurs who want to grow surround themselves with people who have grown and understand that it is a fundamentally different process than and starting a business. So that's one. I think the second thing is to continue to approve the alignment of capital. Over $500 billion post George Floyd was allocated to Black GP. So there is some continued uh, opportunity to, to increase that gap. The challenge, of course, that was over-indexed on early stage and seed. And so what we really need is to be able to continue to interact with more Series A and beyond investors. Uh, you know, when we talk about the thousand, the 3,000 plus Black women that have finally gotten venture funding, me being one of them, the reality is, is that most of those are early stage funding. When you start to look at who has Series A and Series B, those of us, we are down to the hundreds. So we need to improve the continuum of access to capital. Uh, and, and the third thing I would say is, is that we need to really be mindful of the markets that we go in. It's painful to say, but Black businesses concentrated in seven sectors. No disrespect, but I don't know that there's any more shelf space at Target for yet another hair care brand. I don't know there's any more shelf space that's a four for another. And, and not because they don't deserve it, it's just the way the system works. And so I, you know, I continue to emphasize team sport because it's hard, because you need the capital, but also you really want to kind of put together that brain power to say, how do I really do something? innovative, because that's what scales. Uh, so I think those would be the things that I would say that if, if and if you do have a brand that's already out there, really be uh, be crystal clear and, and, and I hate this word, but articulate in terms of how are you different? Uh, we have relationships with, with Target and Whole Foods. Like we get amazing comes every day, but they're not different. And so I do think it all goes back. And, and I think Eris will certainly agree with me. Really spend time understanding where the gaps in the market. Entrepreneurship is not starting a business just because you want it. Entrepreneurship is starting a business because you've identified a gap in the market and customers are willing to pay to fill that gap. And so 
I encourage folks who are working with entrepreneurs to be really clear that I want anybody to have the opportunity and privilege and choice to be an entrepreneur. But regardless of race or gender, not every entrepreneur is successful because it is fundamentally around who you are and understanding the skills and having the right skills to be able to do to run a business. But most importantly, understanding where is there a market gap that you can fill and then the money will come. I, I so love those comments, right? I would probably add that, yes, maybe no more space at Target, but perhaps to think globally, right? We have a whole market out there globally, and sometimes we are often thinking just locally. And so the opportunity to think globally per, is, is perhaps present here. I think when we look historically, we do see that many, um, the history of our uh, entrepreneurship in our in our race, in our, uh, in our communities has been from necessity and therefore not from opportunity, which is a different lens when we start thinking about how do we look for the opportunity, that gap in the marketplace to start doing that. So it's really thinking differently and introducing this concept of teaching in within our community to start getting there. So appreciate those comments. And I think they're right on point for uh, others and as hopefully for others listening to really understand the difference and the mindset in thinking about entrepreneurship. I want to shift a little bit um, and then um, back to Del Delilah. Delilah, um, some thoughts about what uh, Comcast's approach is to supplier diversity and how uh, this has impacted uh, suppliers perhaps can be shifted because I really appreciate um, Melissa's comment that a startup and a small business are two different animals. And when we start blending them, that's often where we start getting into some sort of challenging. And when we're designing these programs, we have to be careful as technical providers to make sure that we're making the difference and not blending the two and confusing uh, the object of these two uh, totally different efforts. Definitely. I mean, I think, I think for any large company, you know, when you look at diversity, equity, and inclusion broadly, it needs to exist well beyond your philanthropic portfolio, period. Um, and, you know, I'm fortunate to say here at Comcast, we're, well, you know, one of the first media companies, the first media company to join the billion dollar round table. Right now, we do about $4 billion with diverse suppliers. And it's interesting because as we're supporting Comcast Rise, many smaller businesses at the end of the day, but still finding ways for them to think about their, their opportunities for growth. Through COVID, it's been interesting because you did have a lot of your mid-sized diverse suppliers sell out, um, sell their companies, um, you know, for any number of reasons, uh, again, sort of further exacerbated by COVID, uh, and those numbers drop sort of temporarily. And, you know, to Melissa's point, to scale a business, um, you know, we have Melody Hobson's Project Black Initiative and several others that are looking to build billion-dollar businesses is definitely not for everybody and requires a different muscle. So what gets you to be that successful mid-sized business doesn't necessarily get you to that next level. So we try to be thoughtful about what does that look like across our scope? How do we, through our supply chain, help small businesses? And then how do we think about the businesses that are ready to get to that next level? Um, and I think, you know, just like any other industry, what you want to do is where is that demand growing, right? Because that's not every single sector growing. There are only so many businesses that could be billion dollar businesses. And how are we thinking about the talent um, that it will take to get to that level? Um, and so we work with a lot of our mid-sized companies. We also think about the areas where we're not meeting our demand right now. And if there are specific investments we can make, we do it a lot from sort of an invisible way when we work with diverse channels that are coming onto our platform. So how do we get them to a place where we can bring them the distribution, but at the same time, help them get the advertising revenue that's necessary to scale? Well, everybody's a content creator, the truth of the matter is the majority of content is still going through select distributors and we have to be thoughtful about, okay, how do we bring more people to that table? Um, not just be talent in front of the camera at the end of the day. So 
we try to look at it from all sides, um, but it does take a very different, you know, one, you need multiple forms of capital to get there, uh, different types of advisors and networks, because you're talking about a much smaller list of purchasers at the end of the day. Um, and you have to be clear about the competitive landscape. Um, especially sort of what advantages you can bring to the table. We're also fortunate that we purchase for Comcast, Sky, and NBC Universal collectively, which gives us a little bit more weight to put behind the supplier. But, you know, a company doesn't become a large company overnight. It takes some time to get there and working through some, some kinks with different suppliers and probably paying more at the beginning of that growth cycle for supplies, which we also do with our diverse suppliers um, as they're making their way along that along that along that growth trajectory thank you um i often say that it's going to take a pipeline right all levels of business at every different stage because to cover this ground that we're trying to cover is going to take the whole cycle the whole pipeline of companies so thank you for really differentiating the various levels in uh from startups to the mature companies that can become part of the supply chain for uh larger uh prime uh, organizations such as Comcast. So thanks for laying that out. You also said a very important point, which is this idea of capital stacking. Uh, as soon as we start the conversation around entrepreneurship um, and building businesses, we immediately go to VCs. I am of the, the mindset that that conversation, yes, is important, but at the same time, they have different ways of raising capital. And I'm wondering, wondering Eris, if there's um, some other ways or methods through your uh, the providing these programs that you talk about this layering of capital in various different ways, definitely by revenue. Revenue is king, um, you know, in terms of, uh, and debt is not a bad thing sometimes when you really start thinking about the various different ways. But can, would you like to uh, address that? And then anyone on the panel can definitely share some opinions about this idea of capital stacking. Yeah, I love, I, I really value that question too, because um, let me tell you one thing, <laughs> I'd say one thing about me, if anybody knows, I am so like adverse to debt, right? I, it just growing up, debt was like this bad thing. And, you know, I was always scared to take out lines of credit, I use credit cards and things of that sort. And then I go into entrepreneurship and then I start working with entrepreneurs and I sing a different story. Right. And one of the things that I think is so important um, is, and I love earlier, you're kind of talking about like understanding our history around entrepreneurship, you know, and one of the reasons so many of us are adverse to, you know, uh, debt and taking this on is because we don't understand it, right? And it's just, it hasn't been part of like our natural DNA. We think of it as being something negative and not necessarily something that could be used to a positive, right? It takes money to make money. And uh, last year I was saying, I wanted to work over the next three years with 10,000 black women entrepreneurs to be capital ready. And people say, well, what does that mean? And I go, well, it doesn't necessarily mean that every single woman who walks into a financial institution will necessarily leave with you know, a new loan or whatever, but at least she'll understand the things that she has to do to be ready for a diverse set of revenue opportunities, funding opportunities. And you know, more than ever right now, we all can attest to this, that we're seeing so much as being committed and allocated uh, for entrepreneurs of color, particularly for Black entrepreneurs. Grant funds for businesses? money that you never have to pay back, right? Money that you can invest into your infrastructure or invest into that new product that you're trying to launch. And so it's really making sure, and we we literally hear from businesses, I mean it to this day, who, who go, oh, I can get a grant, right? They don't even realize that that's an opportunity for them. So one is making sure that they understand what the opportunities are, but you better believe if you're going to go after it, you have to have things in order. So how do we provide additional support and resources uh, to make sure that they have all of their things in order? Because it be, almost becomes repetitive, right? Pretty much you're going to be asking for some of the same things from you, your you know, proof of registration. They may want to see a balance sheet. They may want to see a business plan. So just get all that stuff together. And all you're doing is having to kind of tweak uh, maybe what it is that you're sharing in response to kind of the questions that they're asking. So that's one thing, like we, we really are encouraging businesses to take the time to get 
out of their business and it's hard to be able to invest and focus on their business. And um, I'm a big proponent right now of the grant funds that are being made available. The SBA, I think has increased its funding like astronomically, like take advantage of this moment right now. Um, and then also really making sure that entrepreneurs understand how they can partner uh, and take advantage of community development, right? CDFIs, uh, finance institutions. Everyone always thinks of a bank or they may think of a traditional, like, oh, let me get a business credit card. But these CDFIs are there specifically to work with institutions within their community, right? Who may not necessarily be ready for a large financial institution or may be looking for some smaller, more intimate relationships. So yeah, VC is not always for everybody. Um, and there's just so many different funding opportunities that are available like never before. I love the new category that is now tagged to grants, right? Undiluted capital. Undiluted so, capital. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Melissa, any thoughts on this, um, on that particular subject as we approach uh, sort of wrapping up? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think, I, I mean, I would just double down on everything that was said. I think, um, you know, the reality is, is that it's a continuum to raise money. And to Delilah's point in the chat, it, it's not one size fit all. Capital doesn't fit everybody the same. And so I think what you found, particularly amongst Black entrepreneurs, that many of them have been able to successfully leverage the plethora of grant programs, which has been amazing. Uh, but we're mindful of those may not last forever. Uh, we've already seen some of them waning. And so being mindful of how to use that capital to build up your balance sheet, to demonstrate that you have some financial wherewithal, and you begin to think about other types of funding. Uh, I will say that, you know, many of the new funds, some of the new funds, I should say, that have come on board, including ours, have not just done debt, but done revenue-based financing. And you have some that are doing royalty-based financing. And the nuance there is that people are recognizing the, the imperfection of, of solid cash flow within Black and brown businesses because of the dynamics of the world and structural racism. And so there's a need to say, how do we really innovate even on top of debt? Right. And so when you have things like royalty and revenue, it's less of a straight fixed amount of money, which I know scares people because revenue is, you know, erratic. But I would say that there are indeed financing vehicles that are coming out to really understand the, the uniqueness of cash flow as it relates to, to black and brown entrepreneurs. And then I would really just double down or double up on what, what uh, Delilah put in the chat is that even though there's a bunch of black GPs out there, including myself, it does not mean that, that we're going to give more money to more black businesses. Right. There is a profile. Uh, we have to remember that venture capital, and it's not my money, it's limited partners money who has a full expectation to be paid back and then some. And because of this, you know, historical timeline that it takes a lot longer for a black business to get to a point of inflection, I would say that people should not use television as a benchmark of what is the type of capital that's most appropriate for them, but really talk to their advisors and coaches and say, what is the right type of capital for you right now? And, and I would, the final thing I'm sorry, I would say is that, and if you're making money, then don't look at venture capital, right? Venture capital is really designed to subsidize you know, accelerated growth with this expected abundance of money at the top. My current company is venture backed, and we had to literally achieve massive profitability, ideally within, within two and a half years, which did not happen uh, because of COVID, and we decided not to charge people. And so now we're getting back on track. But it's not for everybody. The, the tensions, the headaches, the stress, and the reporting requirements, as well as the composition of boards, is something that's sometimes people aren't ready for. And so I think the biggest, I guess, takeaway I would say is that capital is a means to an end. Be really clear about where you're trying to go. To talk to your team, coaches, volunteers, whoever, to say, then what is the right type of capital, same as gas, that's going to get me to my journey, right? If you're trying to go 5,000 miles, you do not want a Tesla because it's not going to get you that far. If you are trying, you know, and so I just think, you know, from an analogy perspective, really being mindful that it is not about what can I get, but what is going to get me to where I'm trying to go. Love that final point. What, not what can I get, but what will get me there. Beautiful. Yeah. Well said. As we get ready to really just open up for uh, Q&A questions from the audience and anyone there, please do put your questions in the chat. We encourage you uh, to do that to this awesome panel. Lots have been shared. Wealth of information. Truly enjoyed the conversation. I'm sure there's uh, many more questions out there from the audience. So please do engage with us and put the questions in, in the chat and we will certainly try to do that. As we receive these questions, I do have, uh, I guess, a final questions for the panel. 
what and how can we best support black black and brown businesses and entrepreneurs what may be some suggestions to to others that are listening out there whether they are a corporation or a nonprofit organization um, any thoughts on what something or someone can easily do to support uh entrepreneurs of color yeah three things one actually talk to a black entrepreneur uh, okay. don't call me <laughs> don't call delilah don't call Eris, talk to some, I can tell you who to talk to, but I think talk to some black entrepreneurs that you're actually developing programs in context. Uh, I think the second thing is prepared to be uncomfortable because I don't know too many corporations that unless there's a Delilah thing, they really understand what needs to be done and has the risk aperture to do what is necessary for them to be successful. Uh, and the third thing is talk to their peers. There are lots of companies who came out and did gangbuster commitments that fell flat and not necessarily to their own detriment, just to poor planning and not understanding the, the ecosystem. So those would be the three things. Thank you, Melissa. Anything, uh, Aries or uh, Delilah? Well, I was definitely gonna say talk to and listen to. And I think the last one I would say is invest in, right? And so any opportunity that you have to uh, either invest in the business and or invest in the products and the services. I mean, please take advantage of that. I re recently had a situation, I won't say who, but with a, a global, global company, probably a Fortune 20. <laughs> and uh, they were wanting to do some uh, work with Black women in business, but they decided to pick an organization led by a white male to do that and then called us on the back end, like, can you help us connect to uh, black women businesses? I was like, yeah, but no, <laughs> like, let's have a conversation around this, right? And their reason for selecting that white male led uh, organization was because he was already in their system. That's not acceptable, right? So when you have an opportunity to bring on new vendors or to, you know, to procure services, um, you know, do the extra legwork and take the extra step, even if it means it may be a month later, you know, do your pre-work to know that you need to adjust your timeline to accommodate that. So definitely talk to and listen to, but please take the opportunity to invest in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that's where you have to start. Um, you know, when we think about the work we're doing with Comcast Rise or Project Up, which is our billion dollar commitment, I'm looking at how many vendors are we bringing on and how many of those vendors represent the communities we're trying to serve. And if it's harder, if it takes longer, if I have to use more of them to get to the scale, we will do that because it matters. Um, you know, and, and I do think people have to look outside of their own network. And sometimes you do have to make changes. You know, we're large companies. And when you come to our facilities, we typically have catering and house. Well, we worked with our teams to grant exceptions so that our rise vendors could have their baked goods when we host events on site. Um, when we're promoting a, a, a small business, we try to make sure we're not crashing their system. One of our employees tweeted about one of the coffee companies we supported. They were like, whoa, we can't. <laughs> we can we got all of these orders and so you know we we also want to be thoughtful about what they can accommodate when we're telling these stories but yeah there's nothing like um you know treat treat a small business like you would any other customer ask them directly treat them with respect and be prepared to hear things that you may not like about how they feel like they've been treated by your organization or the system and that's where you have to go to address it Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that you guys brought all the points together. The one other that I would add is that as we talk about investing, it does not have to be a large investment. Patronize that business. Use that business. Go to the business. You know, we buy black. It, it does matter. It does and, and small things. Follow them on social media. That's a free service that's right there. But wonderful discussion. I can't help but just really say that I am even more uh, passionate about this work and excited to see that all the leaders that it's out there and the things that are that we're doing. So thank you so much for this awesome conversation. And I think Natalie, you'll be closing us out. So thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Bussey. And thank you, Delilah Wilson, Scott, Eris Scales, Melissa Bradley, and of course, Dr. Clarissa Myrick Harris. This has been amazing. Uh, I just want to share repeat a few key lessons that um, that I heard and learned. Dr. Bussey, you opened us up with um, 
really acknowledging con a contemporary artist and, uh, and sharing art as a gift and walked us through the history of Black women entrepreneurs and really grounded us in fact. And Delilah, love your comments about um, Comcast Rise and the unrestricted um, grant money and that and the economic justice equals social justice. Melissa uh, Bradley, you know, you turned your first no into passion to continue to move forward and also to help others. And uh, your phrase around capital, community, and coaching uh, being the center of the work that you do and the work that we have to focus on. Thank you so much. And Eris Scales, the CEO of uh, Walker's Legacy Foundation, carrying on really great work. Thank you also for, um, for your comments about women being the backbone of our community and that we have to cultivate the whole woman and listen and learn uh, from the whole woman. There were so many additional um, terminologies that you all introduced around capital, capital stacking, capital readiness, uh, that VC funding is not for everyone, undiluted capital. Uh, I would encourage our uh, listeners to please go back and view this uh, conversation on demand. Uh, thank you so much again to all of our experts and thank you all for taking the time uh, to be with Points of Light and Morehouse College today. Have a great day, everyone.